Good evening to all of you. We are back again with a new team. Today we have Dr. Samira Sheikh with us. Uh, Samira Sheikh is a historian of pre-colonial South Asia at Vanderbilt University in the United States. She was educated at MS University, Baroda, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and ultimately the University of Oxford. Her first book was on Sultanat period Gujarat, entitled Forging a Region, Sultans, Pilgrims, and Traders in Gujarat, 1200 to 1500, which was published by Oxford in 2010. She has co-edited two volumes, an anthology of Ismaili literature, a Shi Vision of Islam by I.B. Torres and the Institute of Ismaili Studies in 2008, and along with Francesca Orsini, After Temur Left, Culture and Circulation in 15th Century North India, published by Oxford in 2014. She is presently completing a book on the port of Bharoch in the late 18th century, after which she will work on a project on Mughal and early colonial maps from Gujarat. I met Dr. Sheikh in 2007 during my stay at Suez as a Charles Wallace Fellow. At that time, she was associated with the Institute of Ismaili Studies London and was a re regular at the weekly seminars being organized by Professor Francesca Orsini. It was during that time uh, that uh, the uh, seminar after Temu left took place. I still remember my interactions with her, Francesca and Indre Bangla. I also recall a special lecture at Amritsar History Congress, uh, if I remember correctly, in 2002. Today, she will be speaking on the topic, How to Say Law in Gujarati, the Intertwined Past of Gujarati and Persian. Over to you, Dr. Samira Sheikh. Full opportunity to speak to you in this really important series. Um, I am so honored to be asked to contribute. Um, you are trying to popularize the uh, serious study of our past, and I'm um, really happy to be able to make a very small contribution to your efforts. And I'm really um, uh, excited by the idea of reaching students who might be interested in the study of history. So let me begin by addressing the question that I raise in the title of my talk. Um, how do you say law in Gujarati? The most common cognate of law in Gujarati is the word kanun. You will find the word sprinkled over most Gujarati newspapers and news websites, as you will see on my slide. <clears throat> it's a common word in conversation. Kanun is, of course, a version of the Persian word kanun, meaning law, statute, or command. There are other words for law, of course. Um, and here is a screen grab from a, a popular online Gujarati dictionary. Um, if you were referring to a specific law or regulation, you might use the words niyam or kaido. The first is a tatsam word, one that is identical to the way it's used in Sanskrit and can mean according to context, rule, restriction, promise, contract, and so on. The other word kaido is from the Perso Arabic Qaeda and means according again according to context, basis, foundation, rule, style, and so on. But the most common term encompassing most of the range of meaning of the English word law, and perhaps some more as well, is kanun. There is no other word that quite captures the range of meaning of kanun, and therefore it continues to be commonly used. The reasons why a Persian word one of many, many Persian words in Gujarati 
finds an exclusive and irreplaceable niche in Gujarati leads us back to medieval history and to the sources through which we can study it. Professor Razavi initially asked me to speak about Gujarati sources for the study of medieval India. Now, my approach to history is a little like my approach to a Gujarati Thali. I like the complete experience. I like to try everything, even if I don't like it all, or if I don't, even if I don't understand it all. Many scholars specialize in the intensive study of one set of sources, usually either those in uh, Persian or in Gujarati, or in one of the European uh, languages like you know, Dutch, Portuguese, or English. There's nothing wrong with that. And many, many wonderful works of scholarship have emerged from a deep engagement with sources in one language. But for me, I prefer to try and get a glimpse of the whole picture. Without tasting the whole thali, I feel I have an incomplete experience. And that means trying to understand to my limited ability and often in translation, sources in multiple languages. So indulge me while I run with this metaphor for a little longer. Let us imagine that the thali, the plate that you see before you represents Gujarat and each dish in this thali represents a language used in Gujarat. Each dish, as you can imagine, has a specific taste, aroma and history. Certain vegetables like uh, brinjal, bengan, ringan uh, or ginger have been eaten in the region since the Indus Valley civilization. Other dishes like the steamed lentil snacks that you see on the bottom uh, right, idara, are known since early medieval times. Tomatoes and chilies, as you probably know, came with the Portuguese. Each dish contributes to the full thali experience and to the nap that you will probably need after consuming it. In an analogous way, each language used in Gujarat has a particular history and a specific role in the linguistic landscape. And for me, it's important to get a sense of the whole landscape. A number of languages were used in Gujarat between about 1100 and 1750. Some were primarily written languages spoken by very few people, such as Sanskrit and Arabic. Others were very widely spoken in a number of dialects and regional forms, uh, but were also written down. The most important of these were, of course, Gujarati and Persian. It's very difficult to speculate about the spoken version of languages. I'm going to leave that to the historical linguists. And so we'll concern with ourselves with the languages that were written down. And these include the languages that you see on your screen right now. Most of us trained to study pre-colonial South Asia have been trained in one language tradition or another. And this, of course, gives us a partial view of the past of Gujarat. Those trained in, say, Jain Apagamsha texts from the 13th century rarely have an idea of the literary traditions of Arabic that might have been produced in the very same town in the very same period. Scholars of the Portuguese or Dutch records have an understanding of Gujarat derived only from the European factories on the coast. If you were trained to read Persian tariqs and tax documents, chances are you might not encounter the poetry of the Charans. I remarked in my first book that uh, most people don't realize that the 15th century uh, saint poet Narsi Mehta who composed Mahatma Gandhi's favorite hymn, Vaishnav Janato Te Ne Kahi Ere, was an exact contemporary of Mahmud Begra, the most powerful and long reigning Sultan of Gujarat. And this is largely because Begra is known to those who are aware of the Persian histories and Narsi Mehta to those who are familiar with his Gujarati poetry. The twain does not often meet, unfortunately. Once again, I'm going to emphasize that there is nothing wrong with immersing yourself in one language tradition. But it sometimes can lead to the impression that people in the past did not interact with each other. We start to assume that Jain monks never encountered Shirazi merchants and Shaivite Brahmins might never have crossed paths with a Hanafi Qazi. Perhaps a better metaphor than the Thali is that of the blind man and the elephant. 
in trying to describe the elephant that is Gujarat, we end up describing just the trunk or the tail and not the whole beast. Okay. So we sometimes forget that most literate people in pre-colonial Gujarat were multilingual. Very few people in pre-modern times, as you can imagine, could read and write. Most of those who wrote were men, usually men from upper castes or a level of privilege. Texts that have been left behind by them reflect that uh, demographic. And writing was often a specialized profession requiring training from a young age. Often the author of a text or document was not the one who physically wrote it. <clears throat> Elite men would dictate letters to their clerks. Holy figures would preach to their followers while literate disciples took notes. Or business people would have their accounts maintained by specialist scribes. <clears throat> These specialist skills of scribes and secretaries, even of literacy itself, was passed down in families and communities. In the Mughal period, courtiers often had bureaucratic offices, Darul Insha, where scribes would write letters and uh, deal with the de daily bureaucracy, whether it was the rent rolls, accounts, correspondence, and you know all the stuff that would come up in, in bureaucracy. It was common for sons to inherit the position of clerk from their fathers. During this time, scribes learned Persian regardless of religion, in the same way that many people today learn English or coding, it was to get a better job. If you were a professional scribe, say from the Nagar Brahmin community in Gujarat, you would have learned Arabic and Persian at the madrasa in your, in, um, your childhood. You would spend your working day writing letters in Persian, but you would probably not go home and chat with your mother in Persian you would probably speak to her in Gujarati, but a few Persian words from work might creep into your conversation. You would probably communicate with the North Indian Fajdar of your town in Hindi and the Maratha Chauthia in perhaps in broken Marathi. If you were a farmer getting your lands assessed for taxes, you might not speak a word of Persian, but you would learn a few words the names of the taxes that were due, the units used to measure the land. Similarly, if you were an Afghan emigre who received a jagir in Gujarat, you would need to learn some of the local language in order to make your wishes known. So for many people, especially the people who wrote things, it was often important to know multiple languages. In 17th century Gujarat, a good scribe would probably need to know Persian, Gujarati, and Hindustani or Ekhta. Some might know a little bit of Dutch or Arabic. In the 18th century, Marathi and perhaps some English would be an advantage to a good scribe. So let's turn to the historic links between Gujarati and Persian, which I've tried to suggest occupy different spaces in the scholarly world. There are very old connections between Gujarati and Persian. Apart from Sindh, Gujarat is the region in South Asia um, that has, is closest to the Persian speaking world. There are connections that go back to the Indus Valley civilization. We know that ships moved between uh, Oman and, um, and Gujarat. Uh, we know there were ancient connections, of course, between Persian and Sanskrit. We know there were contacts that were uh, of a military and a trade nature. Um, from people, uh, when people from, from the Persian speaking worlds came to um, India and Gujarat in the early medieval period. There are a number of Zoroastrian settlements in Gujarat starting from the eighth century who brought Persian um, to, uh, to Gujarat. We have Persian speaking Muslim traders settling on the coastline of Gujarat uh, from the 13th century, probably much earlier. And then, of course, there is also the landborne trade and invasions, including the Ghaznavid invasions of the early 11th century, which also brought Persian into, um, into Gujarat. In short, the Persian language has been familiar to some Gujaratis for a very, very long time. Certainly by the time of the conquest of Gujarat by the armies of Alauddin Khalji in 1297 and the establishment of the rule of uh, the Delhi Sultanate over Gujarat, Persian was already present in many parts of Gujarat. 
what I want to emphasize here is that this is the very same time that Gujarati was coming into existence as a distinct literary language. The author Sitanshu Yashashchandra has argued that a um, narrative poem named Bharateshwara Bahubali Ghor, written by a Jain monk of the Tapagach named Vajrasen Suri, is the first text in the Gujarati language. <clears throat> it was written no later than 1170 and is one of the first to be written in what was probably a non-literary spoken language. <clears throat> People continue to write, continue to write works in the old trans-regional literary languages, Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Apabransha. But writing in Gujarati was something new. And this text, was what one was the first of many to be written in Gujarati, initially mostly by Jains. In the early days, most J Gujarati writers were bilingual. They might be trained in Sanskrit poetics and upper Brahmsha styles, even if they chose to write in Gujarati. During this period, some Jain writers became mediators and interpreters of Islamic learning traditions. They wrote dictionaries that translated between Persian and Sanskrit. They interpreted scientific texts and technical ones. Um, these included uh, uh, the famous Thakkura Peru, the mint master at the Sultanate court in the 14th century, and Mahendra Suri, who is an author who wrote about the astrolabe. It took a while before writers started to write exclusively in Gujarati. Whether or not Vajrasena is uh, responding to Persian directly in 11th century is not what I'm trying to say, and it's perhaps not the point. But what I'm trying to convey to you is that he was starting to write Gujarati in the same literary landscape as other people who were speaking and writing in Persian also in Gujarat. Okay, so one of the key places where the relative roles of Sanskrit, Arabic, Gujarati, and Persian were worked out was in stone inscriptions. And here I'm going to use some materials from an article I published a few years ago, which is on bilingual and multilingual inscriptions from Gujarat. Stone carved epigraphs recorded land rights, the construction of buildings, legal proclamations, and religious donations. They were usually commissioned by patrons to commemorate the building or repair of monumental structures. Those could be mosques, fort walls or gates, wells, sarais, temples, and so on. Constructing a prestigious building and commemorating it in an epigraph was a political act and an expensive one. It signaled power, wealth, and influence of the builder. And so epigraphy gives us an entry into a kind of text production that is intended to signal long-term and public display. More, many of these epigraphs were specially composed by poets or authors. Um, some, some of them use literary conventions such as that, uh, those of the Sanskrit prashasti or praise poem to describe their patrons' achievements, genealogies, or pious intentions. In our period, Persian, Arabic, Sanskrit, and versions of Gujarati were all used for such inscriptions. And sometimes more than one language was used. Thus, we have so-called bilingual, even trilingual inscriptions. From the period of the Gujarat Sultans, that is from the early 15th century to the um, uh, late 16th century, over 300 stone carved inscrip inscriptions have survived and have been published. The largest number of these are in Persian, some with a quotation from the Quran at the outset. A significant number, about 44 to my count, are in Arabic, many of which are tombstone inscriptions uh, produced by the uh, prosperous Muslim merchants of the Gujarat coastline. About 50 inscriptions from this period are in Sanskrit. There are few uh, inscriptions that are exclusively in Gujarati, only seven from this period. But that does not include the many hundreds of uh, hero stones, paliyas, or sati stones that are dotted around every village and town in Gujarat. Uh, it's impossible to date many of them, and uh, many of them are also unpublished. 
There are a number of bilingual inscriptions from Gujarat in our period. The most common are in Persian and Sanskrit, like the one you see on your screen at the moment. Few are in Arabic and Sanskrit. And there are two that include texts, text in Arabic, Persian, Sanskrit, and Gujarati. One of my key findings in that article was this. I found no bilingual inscriptions attached exclusively to sectarian structures like mosques, temples, or Jain buildings. Most of the bilingual inscriptions or trilingual or multilingual ones are attached to civic structures like walls or forts and water structures like step wells. One of the first bilingual inscriptions from Gujarat is the much discussed Arabic, uh, ah, there we go, Arabic uh, Sanskrit one from Veraval in Saurashtra that dates to 1264. The Arabic and Sanskrit texts are on separate stones and the contents of the inscriptions are not identical. The Arabic part was carved two months after the Sanskrit one. They were both produced on the order of the merchant ship owner from Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and, they, and, it records, uh, and they record the building of a mosque. Uh, and it mentions famously that the local authorities and the guardians of the Somnath temple sold land for the building of this mosque. One significant point is that the Sanskrit part of the inscription begins with an invocation to Vishwanath, Om Namah Shri Vishwanath, the Lord, uh, Lord of the world. Usually, this has usually been interpreted as a Sanskrit term that would be equivalent to Allah. Um, the inscription also makes use of the terms Vishwarup, image of the universe, Shunya Roop, formless, uh, and Laksha Lakshya visible, invisible, which are all sort of inappropriate translations for um, Allah, who is believed to be formless. Bilingual inscriptions continue to be produced in the 14th century as well, uh, when Gujarat was ruled by uh, governors sent by the sultans of Delhi. So one inscription from Eastern Gujarat dates from 1304 very soon after Laudin Khalji's armies had conquered Gujarat, but before Sultanate rule was really firmly established. And this inscription is a land grant made during the rule of Karna Vaghela, a ruler who had been ostensibly defeated and banished by the Khalji army in 1299. But from this inscription, he appears to have returned to power in 1304. The inscription is carved into a ma marble tablet. The first Part of the text is 12 lines of Persian in ornamental Nasr script, followed by eight lines in Sanskrit. And the Persian part relates that during the reign of the just king, that is Sadaqate Badshai Adil, Rai Karandev, and the great lords Balchak and Shadi, a man named Tajuddin Hassan made a donation of the territory and proceeds of the village Samba for the Jami Mosque of uh, the city of Kambat. The Sanskrit part gives the date in the Samvat system and declares that the Maharaj Dhiraj, that is the King of Kings, Karna, the Malik Shri Bachak and Shri Hasan gave the village of Sampa for religious purposes, Dharme, for the Kambay Jami Misi, Jami Masjid. The Persian part ends with a warning to Muslims to obey the order uh, and that anyone who attempted to change it would incur the wrath of God and his prophet, according to Quran uh, 2181. The Sanskrit part indicates a different readership. While it is addressed to all the Ranakas or the local landholders of the region, ordering them to honor the endowment, no curses are appended. We, uh, we learn how Karan Vaghela uh, allied with two Mongol chieftains who were renegades from the Khalji army led by Uluk Khan. But we know very little about the actual donor, the man called Tajuddin Hassan, and why he sought to write his inscription uh, or to record his donation to the Kambay Mosque in two languages.
There are many other such inscriptions, and I'm going to just talk about one more um, before moving on. Uh, in 1383, two office officials, Wajedars, of the village of Bakrol, Akram and Nizam Afla Muhammad Shahi, formally attested that 12 bighas of land had been granted to um, individuals called Dungar and Natha for the maintenance of a well. This inscription uses three languages. Uh, there are 15 lines of Persian, followed by sections in Gujarati and Sanskrit. In the Persian part, uh, we hear um, that every year from the date of this deed, they, that is Dungar and Natha, and their lessees are allowed to sow the Kharif and Rabi crops here. Um, the Vajedars, the officials, <clears throat> swore that if they or any of their agents interfered with the cultivations, this is a really interesting um, phrase, their wives would be considered divorced from them, from, from the attesters. Zanan e Mukherran e Mazkur as Mukherran e Mazkur Muttalaka Bashand. In addition, they would have breached the, the pledge to God and the Prophet. <clears throat> um, the Persian text uh, dominates the deed. Uh, it is followed by 14 lines in Gujarati that are incised into the stone. So the Persian is in relief, but the Gujarati is incised in. So it's much harder to read. Uh, and it seems to basically be a list of names preceded by their titles. And here we hear that Dungar, the man who is receiving the grant, is called Shah Dungarshi, the title Shah indicating that he was a merchant. And the deed declares that the stepwell should be enjoyed by uh, Dungarshi and his brothers and their descendants. <coughs> At the end are seven lines of Sanskrit that offer the genealogy of the brothers who built the stepwell for the merit of their late parents. And in, it's interesting here that Dungar's mother, Punji, is mentioned as one of the, one of the builders. The old, the Gujarati section ends with a curse on those who ignore the deed. Violators would have committed the four sins of having killed a cow, a Brahmin, a woman, and a child. And the Sanskrit part is followed by an obscene carving. Um, which is actually fairly common in Western India, um, of a woman having sex with an ass. And this is a common imprecation in medieval Gujarat. Okay, so these bilingual inscriptions suggest that their patrons wish to sig signal towards two separate traditions of claim making. And accordingly, these inscriptions in undertake a, a translation from one vocabulary to another from Arabic to Sanskrit or Sanskrit to Persian as the case might be, but generally those translations are not accurate or not complete. Um, elsewhere, bilingual inscriptions do not translate each other and they offer information that uh, is just happens to be significant in that linguistic tradition that is being uh, chosen at that time. Okay, so that's inscriptions. And now I'm going to move to talking about tax records. And here again, we see a very um, interesting and complex relationship between Gujarati and Persian and other languages um, that, are, uh, uh, that are being expressed here. And here again, uh, I'm going to be using material from an article that is forthcoming. Um, Unlike the Solankis of Gujarat or the Chaulukyas who ruled from about 940 to 1244, the revenue records uh, were uh, kept in uh, Sanskrit, usually the vernacular or Jain Sanskrit of medieval texts or early Gujarati. Once Gujarat came under Delhi Sultanate control in 1297, revenue records might have been transmitted to Delhi in Persian, but probably continued to be recorded by local Hindu and Jain officials in Sanskrit or Gujarati. Letter templates preserved in an undated, but probably about 15th, 14th, 15th century compendium of 
form letters, templates, lekha padhati, were mostly in vernacular or business Sanskrit, some containing Gujarati fragments and phrases. This dual linguistic system of records being kept in Sanskrit or Gujarati but transmitted in Persian uh, probably persisted under the Gujarat sultans in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and that is similar to what was probably the case under the Delhi sultans as well in the 15th century. We have evidence in North India, for instance, that um, that correspondence was um, and, and documents were sometimes written in both um, Persian and Kaithi, which was the language used, the script used by Kayasts. Um, we also know that uh, the Afghan ruler Sher Shah appointed uh, uh, district officials, one set of whom were called Farsi Navis and kept records in Farsi, and the other were Hindi Navis and kept records in um, Hindi. Now, uh, those of us who study pre-colonial uh, South Asia are also aware that the Mughals started a much more widespread use of Persian um, for records from all levels, whether they were imperial farmans or whether they were records kept at uh, the district or perhaps even the village level. Uh, and a lot of emphasis has been placed in, in the last few years on trying to understand this this how this huge edifice of record keeping in Persian could have functioned. Um, it, is, it is generally true that Persian becomes the dominant language of government uh, from the time of Akbar <clears throat> and persists in that capacity until um, British made um, concerted attempts to replace it with English from about the 1830s. And sure enough, the vast bulk of surviving official documentation that we have access to that has survived, uh, especially from the directly governed parts of the Mughal Empire, is in Persian. But I'm going to be arguing that many Mughal officials, and especially their scribes, continued to be multilingual. Consider, for, for example, the large collection of orders and sale deeds from Vrindavan that was studied by Professor Irfan Habib and Tara Pada Mukherjee, a significant proportion of which are in Braj in Nagri script or in Braj and in Persian. Uh, there's a, a, an appointment order, I uh, haven't actually seen the text, but it's cited by J.F. Richards who tells, uh, which, which is from the early 18th century, and it enjoins uh, provincial officials to collect uh, account papers of every village uh, of, of the Pargana and translate them into Persian before sending the translated accounts to the emperor. And so it's clear that at the village level and sometimes even at the Pargana level, uh, records were not necessarily all kept in uh, Persian. And I think if we are to exclusively emphasize Persian as the only language of, um, of record keeping under the Mughals, then we miss a really lively multilingualism that is, um, that is being practiced at uh, throughout the Mughal period and into the 18th century as well. And in Gujarat, um, the situation is the same. Um, most of the official paperwork that has been collected, placed in archives, analyzed, studied by scholars is in Persian. Um, but we still are at the start of, uh, of really sort of large scale study of documents. Of course, a lot of very important work has been done <coughs> at Aligarh. Um, I'm thinking uh, of Professor Shirin Husvi's work on urban records from Gujarat, for instance. Um, incredible work has been done, but but um, still, that only scratches the surface. There is still a lot to be discovered, still a lot to be found. Many records also are not found in traditional archival repositories. They are found with households. They are found with the people who inherited uh, family records. Um, it is clear, even from the work that has been done so far, that Persian was not the only la language of record keeping. There is a set of uh, land records from Ahmedabad, for instance, um, that has been studied by, um, by scholars such as Makran Mehta and Yatinder Dikshit. 
uh, and these are documents called khat patras. Um, this is a very interesting compound term using the Persian word khat, letter, document, and patra, which is Gujarati for the same thing. Um, and it suggests, um, and, the, and studies of these khat patras, khat patras, um, uh, which are in Gujarati in the Nagari script and others in Persian, suggest that there was um, a considerable diversity in the way records were kept. Outside the Mughal bureaucracy, Gujarati business firms often kept records in Gujarati and did so since medieval times. There are a few surviving papers from the Geniza records, for instance, which suggest early commercial use of Gujarati. 17th century inscriptions from Sukhutra also show uh, commercial Gujarati being used as do Hundi's promissory notes and account books. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to a list compiled uh, in the mid 18th century by the author of the great compendium, the Mirate Ahmadi, um, who claims to have had access to the account books of a Hindu official who had worked for the uh, sultans of Gujarat in the 16th century. And here we see the, the relationship between Persian and Gujarati terminology. So the, the, the terms highlighted in red are the ones uh, that seem to come from Gujarati usage. And so you see again, compound terms in which you have say, Sire Mandavi, Sire being, uh, uh, non-agricultural taxes and Mandvi being market or uh, marketplace. Uh, you see the word Purchat, uh, which probably is derived from the, the Gujarati word Pura, or pole. You see Hasil, uh, again, Hasil is um, a tax. Uh, Muttiva Chungi, uh, which again refers to um, a fistful of grain. Um, and this pattern of sort of combining Gujarati and Persian in the names of taxes continues into the 18th century. Um, and I'm going to um, move now to another uh, document from the uh, middle of the 18th century, uh, from the 1760s, <coughs> which is from the realm of the Nawab of Bharuch, uh, one of the successor states um, of Gujarat once the Mughals uh, started to lose their hold. Um, here we learn, and this, this record comes to us from a British official who was trying to figure out how um, the Nawabs got their taxes. And we have a long, long, long list of taxes um, that he was able to elicit. So he, he, he heard that each village paid two kinds of taxes. One tax was called the Ayn, and the other was called the Vero. Now, N is uh, the real or true land revenue. It's abbreviated from the Persian N Jama or N Ul Mal. Um, N Jama was a commonly used term used for the regular standard Mughal uh, estimation of the land revenue, the Jama Bandi. Or it was used for the gross realized land revenue. And the N seems to represent the traditional share of produce that the um, subject was supposed to submit to the ruler. Vero, however, um, is slightly different. Uh, plural, the plural of the term is vera. Um, these were additional dues charged by the ruler in addition to the basic land revenue. Now the common modern meaning of vero is simply tax or cess, or as defined in the mid 20th century uh, Gujarati lexicon, the Bhagavad Gomandal as uh, cash charges for government needs levied on farmers over and above land revenue. Uh, the term could also be used for sort of forced taxes, but uh, and it is used in the um, 18th centuries, even in the 17th century for, for taxes that were uh, taken by force. Um, and I'd spent some time trying to figure out the etymology of the word vero. Now, one interpretation is um, that it could be a ancient Gujarati word, right? No, it's, it does not derive from Sanskrit, but maybe it was just an ancient word used in um, 
Gujarati, uh, for Gujarati tax practice, even say before the Gujarat Sultanate, then you would think the term would appear or some term like it would appear in the, uh, uh, in the records of those who preceded the Gujarat Sultans, the Solankis or Chalukyas or the Vaghelas. But I have been able to find no such term, nothing that even sounds like Vero. There's Patta, there's Bhet, uh, but not, nothing that sounds like Vero. So I have one intriguing suggestion as to the uh, origins of the term Vero. Um, one possibility is that it is a vernacularization of the word Faruiyat, a Persian term used in 17th century Gujarat for forbidden taxes, taxes that were not supposed to be uh, levied on subjects. And if it is indeed a uh, Gujaratification of Faruiyat, then it is really interesting that by the 18th century, Veru is used in Persian, but not Faruiyat. In other words, um, authors such as the author of the Mirate Ahmadi, the author of the um, um, uh, other, other 18th century uh, Persian texts, accept the um, uh, that Vero is now a accepted part of the Gujarati vocabulary and they don't feel the need to use the Persian term Faruya. I can't be certain of this, but I think it is a possibility. In any case, here before you, you see again, these compound words for taxes, um, some of which have both Persian and, um, and Gujarati uh, uh, words that, that are combined into these compounds. So Kami Vero, for instance, Kami comes from shortfall. Uh, shortfall in revenue for the previous year would uh, be made up by a Vero, a tax uh, levied to, to make that up. Um, Raza um, the uh, uh, a tax, um, uh, the, a, a tax that would be levied in um, return for permission to, to um, harvest your crops. Uh, Havaldari, this is a common Gujarati word now, uh, is probably, um, uh, is, is the Persian term Haval, Havaldari, Havalidari. Vajiyat, Vajiyat is Vaziyat. Jamadar Sukhri is, is, refers to the, the military, um, uh, post of the Jamadar and the tax levied to pay them. Nimaksar, um, refers to the tax um, on the panning of salt. Um, so this distribution of Persian and Gujarati vocabulary in these tax names, um, I'm going to suggest, may be read as an index of the distribution uh, of the relationship between the imperial, the imperial Mughal and the local. The Mughal Persian um, revenue arrangements were represented by the Ayn Jama, and these continued to be the indispensable means of revenue collection in the 18th century, even when the Mughals were losing their hold. But these were somewhat inflexible. In the 18th century, which we know is a very entrepreneurial time, it was all these additional vera, which were acknowledged as a common, if reviled practice since the 16th century. And these are the the ones that facilitate networks of hierarchy and obligation that keep the empire going. The two systems are intertwined. Mughal granted authority to collect the Ayn confers on the aspirant the authority to additionally solicit Vera. Right? So these Persian Gujarati compound phrases that we see with Persian terms generally used for offices like Jamadar, Karkun, um, uh, Wazifdar, and Gujarati terms for entitlements, Vera, Sukhri, Patti, show some, something of the relationship between uh, the languages, Gujarati and, and Persian, in this period. But I want to emphasize here that Persian revenue terminology was not imposed on the vernacular Indic world through conquest, as some of our nationalist, recent nationalist historiography would have it. 
In fact, the N, that is the Persian part, and the Vera, the vernacular part, constituted each other. They needed each other in, in order to, um, to, to function in a distinctively Mughal system of governance and taxation. Okay, I'm going to conclude now um, by just pulling together a few points. So how should we think about the linguistic landscape of pre-colonial Gujarat and the texts that have survived for us today? Should we think about it in terms of here's what is said in Gujarati, here's what is said in Persian, here's what is said in um, Dutch or English? Instead, I think we could po possibly think of texts being produced in three arenas that are overlapping. First is the courtly, the legal, and the bureaucratic. The second is the devotional or the literary. And the third is business. By inscri discussing inscriptions and tax documents, I have covered only a very small part of the first category. But that's, I think, enough for today. I've taken, um, I've taxed your patience for long enough. In each of these categories, we find that languages did not remain watertight from each other. The story of pre colonial India is one of continually remade alliances and networks. Now, I am allergic to the term that has become fashionable these days, fluid identities. I don't like it because I think most people knew who they were and where they belonged. They did not shift, as the word fluid suggests, from one allegiance to another, uh, as though they were changing clothes. But they did make alliances. They found new patrons or colleagues, and they continued to do business. And business, as we know, is important to Gujaratis in the past and today. Sometimes these alliances were disrupted by violence, uh, but people generally made their way back from hatred and violence to pragmatic coexistence. To return to the title of my paper, How to Say Law in Gujarati. Over the past century and a half, there have been multiple efforts to Sanskritize Gujarati, and those continue today. Since the late 1800s, it has repeatedly been asserted that Gujarati is a daughter language of Sanskrit, and words deriving from other languages are like foreign invaders, destroying the purity of traditional Gujarati. But what I hope I have shown you is that the Gujarati language is a product of its history, like all languages. And history is always messy. Languages are not watertight plastic bags. In order for people to communicate and get along with each other, they have to learn each other's languages, even if it's only a few words. This leads to the adoption of words that fit the context, that offer a very specific meaning. Gujarati, as I've tried to show, becomes a distinct language at a time when Persian is gaining ground in, uh, as the language of law and state. And if there is no exact cognate, no exact meaning um, word for kanun in Gujarati, then kanun is the word that, that is most suitable to be used. But why does kanun continue to be used in spite of over a century of efforts to purify the language? And one reason is, of course, that it's convenient. There is no Gujarati word for computer or internet, for instance, without creating absurd compounds like, you know, lohapath gamini for uh, the railway. So we basically say computer and internet in Gujarati. And since ancient times, Gujaratis have been perfectly pragmatic with importing words nowadays from English and Hindi. And in the same way, that's how Kanun entered Gujarati. And uh, it's too cumbersome to create an equivalent, an exact equivalent for Kanun. And so it continues. Perhaps there's something else of the medieval that has survived in the relationship between citizens and their state. We are no longer subjects of a sultan or a raja. We still have to prove our existence to the state. The burden of offering proof of our existence, as we saw during the citizenship bill protests, rests upon us, upon subjects. We still have to queue up with documents at government offices. We have to retain copies of documents. And Nandini Chatterjee's recent uh, work on Mughal law really emphasizes this, that the burden of 
um, keeping documents often rests with individuals and households. And perhaps this emphasis on Kanun and the structure in which we provide the dastavez, uh, the documents, is, um, is indicative of this relationship. And as long as the linguistic domain that, that is embodied in that relationship between citizen and state continues, it will continue to be perpetuated. Politicians, however, can't control language. Gujarati will continue to be messy and will continue to evolve and to import vocabulary as it has done throughout history. Whether Kanun survives in Gujarat remains to be seen. Thank you for listening. And I look forward very much to your questions and your comments. Uh, thank you, Samira. Uh, I hope you are ready for the questions. Sure. There are a few questions. Uh, Shall I stop sharing now? Is that I can uh, stop you stop your sharing so that uh, you may be able to see us? Yes. Stop your sharing. Uh, so uh, let, let us have the first question. Uh, there is a question by Mr. Ali Hader. Uh, did Abdul Wahab Bohra? the chief Qazi of the Mughal Empire play any role in execution of Qutub Khan Qutbuddin, the 32nd Dai Mutlaq of Daudi Bohras? And did money play a role in his execution? Uh, Although I don't think that is related to with the topic, but an interesting I'll question. I'll be happy to answer that question. I have written an article about Aurangzeb uh, and his persecution of uh, many Shia or Ismaili groups in Gujarat. Uh, you can find that on your my academia page if you look for it. There is, I have not found a very direct connection between Qazi <coughs> Abdul Wahab and the execution of Qutub Khan um, of Sayyidna Qutbuddin. Um, he was certainly uh, very, uh, Qazi Abdul Wahab was certainly very powerful at that time. Um, but and I, I, he had already made contact with Prince Aurangzeb, who was the governor of Gujarat in, in 1640-41. But as far as I can tell, I have not been able to find a direct connection. But I have suggested in that article that Qazi Abdul Wahab's um, family, uh, who were Sunni Bohras, uh, who had had their fa family had in ancestrally been Ismaili Bohras, but they had become Sunni over time, that they stood to benefit financially from persecution of the Ismaili Bohras. So more details in that article. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Samira. The next question, please. Uh, the next question is by Nanak Ganguly. Why were two or more languages chosen in these inscriptions? Was it to create an overreaching Gujarati identity? What was the percentage of inscriptions in local Gujarati? So my detailed study, um, <clears throat> why were two or more languages chosen? Um, I, I think I've tried to suggest that many languages were used <clears throat> in the period between 1100 and 1750. The most frequently used languages were um, uh, Persian and Gujarati, <clears throat> but Arabic and Sanskrit also continue to be used as well as half a dozen others. <clears throat> but as we see over time, uh, there is more production of Gujarati texts um, and uh, uh, Persian also becomes a very important language of state and governance. Um, we, um, however, Gujarati, especially in epigraphs, in, in inscriptions, can, tends to be used less. And this is partly to do with the point I mentioned earlier that, you know, if, if you're going to be building a massive mosque or spending a huge amount of money on building a, 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 a step well or a city wall, then you want to convey your grandeur and your uh, importance to the world. And you would do that in the most prestigious languages available. 
And those generally tended to be Persian and Sanskrit, sometimes Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit. So if there was information that was sort of business-like information, you know, um, to do with the nitty gritty of a land grant or to do with uh, uh, the specifics of a of, of family um, inheritance, then that might be put in Gujarati, but the bulk of the inscription would be in the prestige languages. Um, so <clears throat> Gujarati inscriptions tend to be fewer. However, this does not include the hundreds of inscriptions that are hero stones or sati stones um, that are many of them have hardly been published or or even um, cataloged. Uh, yeah, so it's it's not really possible for me to to guess at a percentage of inscriptions of the ones that I've studied, maybe ten percent um, from the Sultanate period are exclusively in Gujarati. Right. Uh, and this is uh, a phenomenon which is not confined only to Gujarat. I mean, in other regions also, uh, we do find uh, multilingual or bilingual inscriptions. Uh, uh, for example, outside Gujarat, uh, uh, say, for example, in Rajasthan, uh, we do have inscriptions which are both in Persian as well as uh, the local Rajasthani. Uh, 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 but uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know whether it is uh, true for Gujarat as well or not, sometimes uh, the content, the information uh, contained in the Persian version of the inscription and the uh, local vernacular uh, uh, inscription, the, the, the information sometimes uh, is different. Yes. I don't know whether you, you, you find such uh, in epigraphs Yes, uh, because uh, it appears uh, whatever I have read about them is that in the Persian ones it is for the praise of the kings, the imperial court, and so on and so forth. Because Persian is supposed to be read by them. Yeah, you know fully well that uh, the local population would not be well versed with the Persian script at all. They would be much more uh, well versed in the other language and script which is being used, and thus. In that particular language, an inscription instead of praising, praising the sultan or the king, there is much more information about the person who is picking up these uh, yes. graph inscriptions. Yes. So yes. possibly this is a universal truth, and uh, we find it even in Gujarat. And yes. uh, Doctor uh, Professor Sabir Sheikh has already shown how what kind of informations are there. Now let us take up the question of Nanak Ganguly. Uh, are there uh, more examples like Raja Vino uh, Mahajavya? I don't, I can't pronounce okay. that. Written in Sanskrit, patronized by sultans. Yes. We have great examples during Hussain Shahi times in Bengal. Yes, indeed. Uh, so I'm glad you brought up this uh, this really remarkable text that was. Uh, the Rajvinod Mahakavya, which is a long narrative poem produced uh, in praise of Mahmud Begra, uh, the ruler of Gujarat between 1458 and 1509, I think. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, um, he was a patron of uh, literature and in many languages. Um, including Sanskrit, and he had Sanskrit poets at his court, as did his son, um, Sultan Muzaffar II, uh, who succeeded him. Um, there are uh, there are indeed more texts that were uh, uh, commissioned by the sultans or were dedicated to the sultans that are in Sanskrit. Some of the, those are technical manuals. So you have uh, dictionaries, you have works on veterinary science, um, for instance, on horses. Uh, you have works on of astronomy, uh, and those are com composed um, at the time of Mahmud Begda and dedicated to him. Similarly with uh, Muzaffar Shah, um, we also have texts on music um, that were produced under um, Muzaffar Shah and you know reflect the the uh, traditions of music at the court of the Gujarat Sultan. So yes, there are a number of others where I would really recommend you read. Um, Dr. Aparna Kapadia's uh, wonderful book that came out a couple of years ago um, in praise of kings, where she has done a detailed study of the Rajvinod Mahakavya and other Sanskrit texts produced at the time of the Gujarat Sultans. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
the next question uh, by Mirza Hasnain. As many Hadith writers and Muslim saints are said to be born in Gujarat, and Muslim presence is said to be present there since the time of Caliph Umar, do we find the prominence of Arabic language in Gujarat? And as Bombay Presidency province during British era also consists of Sindh, do we find prominence of Sindhi language in Gujarat? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so Gujarat is one of the regions that was um, uh, the first to be one of the regions of, of South Asia that was first to be reached by Muslims. And as you as you mentioned, it's since the time of the Caliph Umar. Um, we there have been Arabic speaking Muslims on the coastline of Gujarat since the eighth century. Um, and so therefore there has been, yeah, a very interesting prominence of, uh, of Arabic in Gujarat, which is perhaps more than in other regions. Um, you have important schools of Arabic learning. Um, the period that I'm more familiar with, the time of the Gujarat Sultans, um, you have a number of really important muhaddisin um, uh, um, uh, um, and other scholars who were coming to Gujarat, who were being invited by uh, the Sultans of Gujarat to, to come and sort of bring their knowledge traditions to his court. And again, um, Mahmud Begra is particularly interesting because he is inviting Sanskrit scholars, he's inviting um, great Arabic scholars to, to come from as far as Mecca, or sometimes even from Egypt to come and settle here. There are other traditions of Arabic learning in Gujarat uh, that are present as well that are independent of state patronage. So you also have, for instance, the long tradition of Arabic learning represented by the Bohra community, uh, the Daudi Bohras, the Alavi Bohras, the Suleimani Bohras, who still have um, important traditions of learning and, and uh, reproducing um, their textual tradition. There's a wonderful, a uh, book that is uh, uh, soon to be published by Dr. Oli Ackerman, which is on the manuscript traditions of um, uh, the Alavi Bohra community uh, in Gujarat. Um, and the, the Bohra libraries, again, have this incredible repository of Arabic um, uh, texts. So it's not just uh, the state-sponsored Arabic learning. It's not just Sunni learning. Uh, there are many varieties of um, Arabic uh, learning that are present in Gujarat from a very early period, um, and Arabic scholars and people who, who um, either traded, uh, who spoke in Arabic and who came for trade, et cetera, were also welcome and um, formed long lasting communities in Gujarat. Uh, question of Sindhi. Uh, yeah. Interesting question. Um, now here I'm going to, uh, now, Yes, there was a lot of coming and going between um, Sindh and Gujarat. And in fact, um, the entire region of Sindh and Gujarat in some ways and, perhaps, and parts of Rajasthan should be considered a single zone in the period before um, the independence of India and Pakistan. Uh, people who had trade contacts, had linguistic com uh, commonalities, um, and people traveled within that zone with, without any difficulties. And partition really broke that very long standing uh, sort of ecosystem as it were. Um, whether Sindhi was present as a language in Gujarat, I know less. And most of what I know is from the uh, other Ismaili tradition in Gujarat, that is the Nizari Ismaili tradition, in which texts uh, were produced in Gujarati, Kachi, and Sindhi for devotional purposes. And these texts were called Ginans. And they represented uh, uh, devotional poems, which were produced in praise of the Ismaili Imam. Many of those uh, manuscripts of those were produced in Gujarat and Kutch from an early period, certainly 16th century onwards. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what I know of the presence of Sindhi texts in Gujarat from the early period. Uh, but uh, I, there, there is scope for more investigation there because there were certainly important Sindhis who were, say, part of the uh, royal family of the Gujarat Sultans. Uh, two of the wives, um, one of the wives of Mahmud Begra 
was the daughter of the Jam of Sindh, um, and there were other uh, important connections too. Uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Sheikh, I mean, I would uh, like to ask you uh, in furtherance of what uh, Mirza Hassan has asked. I mean, uh, I have not uh, actually surveyed anything or uh, seen in anything in detail as far as Gujarat monuments are concerned. But I, I did uh, visit uh, Bengal, West Bengal, the Indian side of Bengal, and uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, structures at um, Malda. Uh, hazrat e pandwa and Gaur, uh, the Sultanate uh, period settlements of Gujarat. And uh, what I found is that uh, contrary to what we find in North India, most of these structures had inscriptions which are in Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, very few uh, Persian inscriptions were encountered, although most of the uh, you know official histories of the uh, bengal sultanate were written in persian what about gujarat i mean these uh, you know uh, arabic inscriptions for example in uh, you talked about sindhi script being used for the religious you know ginans and other uh, such literature so uh, are these epigraphs in arabic in gujarat are they only religious in nature or do they occur uh, for secular uh, buildings and structures giving us information not about religion, but about other things? Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, so from the period before the Sultanate, um, before the Gujarat Sultanate, um, there are a number of Arabic inscriptions. Um, most of those are tombstone inscriptions. Uh, or are inscriptions in mosques. So they tend to be religious in nature. The tombstone inscriptions will often give us some details about the person who was buried. Uh, and we know from Elizabeth Lamborn's work that many of those tombs, tombstones were in fact commissioned while the person buried there was still alive. Uh, and there was a huge trade in tombstone inscriptions produced in Cambe that stretched from uh, Mogadishu, East Africa to uh, Sumatra. So uh, those inscriptions tended to have some details about the individual, but usually would have a verse from the Quran, et cetera, uh, similar to mosque inscriptions. One interest, really interesting Arabic inscription is the one that I mentioned, the one from Somnath Viravali in 1264, which has a long, um, uh, which has a lot of detail about the nature of the grant that was being made by the trustees of the temple of Somnath for the building mosque and the, uh, the 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 donations that, that were being made um, for the purpose of maintenance of that mosque um, but other than that um, um, and and there are there are more sort of in, informational or secular Arabic inscriptions but by and large they tend to be um, the, the sort of bulk of the information tends to be conveyed in Persian thank you uh, can we have the question by Mirza Hasnain? Uh, 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 Acha Hasnain Aziz, Madam, I remember listening to your talk Aurangzeb a Gujarati Bacha. Do we find more quotations from Aurangzeb in which he showed his love for Deccan, as he wished to be buried in Deccan and also loved his birthplace, uh, the Hout? Uh, I'm sure you can find such. Uh such quotations i'm not uh, i'm not the biggest expert on aurangzeb <laughs> and i think that uh, question should be put to professor rizavi rather than me uh, mm -hmm. but yes i'm sure if we put our heads together we can find more uh, but yes he certainly was very attached to his birthplace and he wrote about that um, so he is one of those individuals born dahod is now sort of on the borders of gujarat and madhya pradesh but um, Yes, he was very attached to the place he was born. Interestingly, uh, I recently noticed that uh, I'm writing a book on Bharuch, and I noticed that uh, Aurangzeb didn't like Bharuch at all. He called it uh, Sukhabad. It was extremely dry. And this is a, actually uh, an echo of uh, the term um, um, his grandfather, Jahangir, used for Ahmedabad, which was Gardabad, city of dust. 
Um, so I think sometimes the Mughals got quite exasperated at the heat and dust of Gujarat too. Right. Mm, so and uh, the question by Shona Ghosh. Uh, thank you for your fascinating uh, presentation, Professor Sheikh. We know from the seminal work of Farad Hassan that the local played a crucial, if in fact dominating role in the execution and implementation of Mughal imperial law in Suba Gujarat. As such, how was the language of the law itself affected or rather reconfigured in the everyday local legal transactions of the Qazi's court? And on what basis did subjects make the choice of which court to approach and what language to communicate in? Uh, Shonak is one of my students, so I'm going to out him over here. Uh, uh, and Shonak, I think the first part of that question should definitely be put to Professor Farhat Hassan himself. Uh, so I'm going to answer the question based on what I know, which is, um, uh, and here's where I, I have been looking uh, at uh, some of the records of the Qazis of Bharuch. Uh, from uh, the 18th century and trying to sort of build up a picture of uh, how the Qazi's uh, court sort of operated um, in the 18th century and after that. Uh, and actually, I would, I would uh, also uh, direct you to a wonderful recent article by Elizabeth Lost, which is on the Qazi's of Baruch, but in the 19th century, based on the same set of sources. Um, I think uh, the only point I would like to make here is that, um, uh, you know, there were a number of dispute resolution mechanisms that are available in the 17th and 18th century Gujarat. One important one at the village level is the panchayat. Um, and uh, Dr. Amrita Shodhan has written some important work regarding how panchayats function. These were usually um, uh, made up of, you know, village elders belonging to different communities who sort of resolved disputes at the local level. Those disputes often did not actually make it into textual form. Um, they, there was also um, recourse to the Qazi's court in cases of, you know, inheritance, in cases of divorce, in cases of dispute over, over boundaries of, uh, of land, of, um, um, of, uh, of property. And many of those, as you know, have been discussed by Professor Farhat Hassan. Um, it's a little more difficult to sort of figure out which, how people made such choices in what sort of, I, my, my sense would be that, um, uh, that, that if a dispute could not be resolved within the community, within the village, within the sort of local environment, then it would sort of escalate the Qazi. Uh, but we also do know that in many cases, people took direct recourse to the Qazi, um, even if they had not tried to resolve the dispute in a, prior to, to, to approaching the Qazi. Um, so I think, you know, Professor Hassan's work is, I think, still the gold standard in this respect, but more can be done as we, as we investigate um, uh, further the sort of documentary traditions of Gujarat, both in Gujarati and in Persian. Uh, and try to figure out how people approached uh, uh, the state and the and the courts, and how um, and 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 I think that will that will throw some more light on the relationship you point to, that is between the local um, and the um, uh, and the imperial or the state. It's important to recognize here that by the late 18th century, the Qazi's court is no longer associated firmly with the Mughal state. In fact, the Qazis sort of seem to be semi-autonomous. They are, they are dispensing justice, not necessarily as an arm of the Mughal state, but, um, but as sort of entities that would provide attestation services, that would, uh, that would provide um, uh, you know, services for, for the, the registration of marriages, nikahnamas, for the resolution of disputes and so on. And that necessarily did not, did not mean that they were sending reports of, you know, their judgments uh, to the Badshah, Shah Alam, or whoever it was. But still more, much more needs to be done on, on the judicial history of, uh, of uh, the Mughal period. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sheikh. I mean, uh, I would like to just add to that that uh, as I, I mean, I would really actually agree with you that uh, much, much more work is uh, uh, needed as far as this theme, this topic is concerned. But I would uh, uh, suggest uh, Shonak uh, to also go through uh, a work which was published long back uh, at Aligarh, the uh, religious and quasi-religious offices uh, by uh, Dr. Rafat Bilgirami. Uh, that's a book, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, published sometime in 1970s by the Oxford Uni University Press, which deals with the uh, legal issues involved in the in the uh, uh, Mughal court. Uh, I mean, how uh, whether these uh, Qazis were actually serving under the Mughals or uh, how they uh, actually le at later stages uh, emerged as, uh, you know, uh, independent entities in themselves. Uh, just like Farah Hassan, I mean, when uh, these people at the same time when Farah Hassan was using uh, the Kambe documents uh, to write his book, uh, I also had the opportunity to uh, go through these uh, documents which are there in National Archives. And I would give just two examples from there. I offhand uh, uh, recall suddenly when you were talked about that there was a case of a Musammat Belbai, uh, a, a Hindu woman, uh, who had uh, married a Muslim man, uh, possibly converted. And uh, when her father died, she wanted uh, a share in the property of her father. Uh, possibly there was much dispute and uh, it was not uh, solved at a local level. So she uh, applied to the court of the Qazi. The matter went to the Qazi. I mean, the documents are there in National Archives regarding that. And the decision which the Qazi gave was that uh, this matter, whether she is legally, uh, I mean, uh, supposed to get share in her dead father's property or not, was to be decided by, uh, you know, uh, sahib -e shara those who know the law. Uh, uh, generally, uh, during the 20th century and 21st century, unfortunately in India today, whenever we refer to the term Shara or Shariat, we generally mean the Islamic law. But in this document, the Sahib Shara did not mean uh, the expert of Islamic law. It simply meant an expert of law, possibly uh, the uh, uh, Hindu law. Uh, uh, and that is why uh, when you go forward in this document, you find the reference that the matter was referred to the pundits uh, who gave the ruling that because she has converted, so she cannot get the share. And the Qazi accordingly gave the decision that she should not succeed. So this I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I would like to point out, Samira, you must have seen, I think probably Farah Hassan has also mentioned that and that is that in the nikah namas which are there and there are a series of nikah namas which survive uh, from gujarat uh, uh, say uh, late uh, uh, 17th century uh, uh, there are also similar nikah namas which are there in uh, you know a source of akbar's period munshat e namakin which have nothing to do with gujarat but uh, these documents have Nikanamas, those Nikanamas in fact survive. And in those Nikanamas, we find that there are various conditions which are listed. And one of the conditions, uh, as far as Hindu women is concerned, is that uh, they are uh, entitled for Meher, which is, you know, something which is quite an Islamic tradition. So a Meher being uh, given uh, to a woman by her husband, both of them being Hindus. So, you know, th th these, uh, you know, documents uh, which date back from late 17th century and 18th century, I think Farah has done work on that, all right, but they contain so much information that I think that much more aspects of law can be drawn uh, through that. I mean, in fact, uh, I remember all these because I had a chapter uh, in my thesis, long, long back, uh, 20, 30 years back, when I did my, uh, when uh, I was writing a chapter on 
legal system under the Mughals. I was writing on the professions, the lawyers. There I, I had uh, read these documents and found such evidences. So possibly if someone works on them, much more material, the, such material can be encountered. Uh, I must thank uh, Professor Sabita, Dr. Sabita Shaykh once again for a beautiful lecture. I think uh, we have uh, gained a lot uh, from what uh, she has said. Uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, there were many, I mean, new informations uh, which were added to my knowledge. Uh, I have been following Sabida Sheikh. Uh, I have read her articles on Aurangzeb. I have read her articles which uh, she has written, uh, some of them on Gujarat, some of them on Ismailis. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, 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 all of them are superb books which I recommend to all those uh, who are viewing uh, this program uh, to hunt for it and uh, look for it. Now, you point out uh, it during the course of your lecture, the term sire, which if I uh, understood correctly, you said that this is a, a, you know, a, a Gujarati term which has been taken up. Uh, Not sire. Sire okay. is a Persian term. Ah, sire is a Persian term. That is what I mean. I, sorry, I misunderstood misunderstood sire is a term which is being uh, very popularly used throughout. Uh, uh, Mandvi, the, Mandvi is the Gujarati term. Mand, Mandvi is also a term uh, which uh, 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 I find mentioned uh, in a number of documents and number of things apart, even apart from possibly derived from the Gujarati tradition, but Mandvi possibly also Mandi or Mandvi. Mandi, Mandvi, yes. Part of uh, that. Uh, now, uh, you also pointed out about uh, Vero, uh, uh, which you tried to say, uh, you define Vero as? Uh, it's an additional tax or a forced tax. Yeah, because, you know, uh, in Arabic, there is a term Furu, uh, Furuat Adin, for example. That's exactly what I think might be the... The, the ancillary, ancillaries. Yes. So uh, I would not say that they are the forbidden taxes, they are the ancillary taxes. I mean, this is my understanding of yeah. the term. Uh, so possibly, I mean, uh, these were the ancillary taxes uh, which were being accrued to the state, were being uh, collected by the state. Yes. Uh, 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 but lastly, I would just point out uh, that uh, we at uh, ASHA, Aligarh Society of History and Archaeology, uh, had been thinking in terms of certain publications. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Professor Farah Hassan, uh, uh, who is one of the members of this Asha, and uh, Professor Jabir Raza, another very serious uh, se uh, senior colleague of ours, uh, we were thinking of uh, coming up with a volume on, uh, you know, uh, epigraphs. Uh, the, the the inscriptions uh, which belong uh, to the medieval period because uh, uh, possibly, I mean, this is one of the very neglected fields on which although uh, much work is needed and much work has been done, but nothing has come together uh, so that people might benefit. Uh, so uh, I reserve the right to request you uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, present uh, a paper uh, whenever we uh, actually... Uh, uh, finally decide uh, uh, because uh, I, I find that uh, uh, this topic of yours uh, uh, contained much, much beautiful information as far as the, the, the inscriptions, bilingual, especially bilingual inscriptions of 17th century Gujarat are concerned. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, acceding to our request to join us. And looking forward that in future also uh, uh, you would uh, cooperate with us. R is an attempt, uh, very simple, uh, that these days, as you rightly pointed out at, at the fag end of your lecture, we are passing through bad times. And during this period, when generally the impression is being given that myth is history, uh, ours is a small effort uh, just to pinpoint to all those who are interested and that is why we are putting up these lectures on the YouTube. They will be uh, there forever. Uh, uh, and people can watch them uh, whenever they want. Our attempt is that they should uh, be made, uh, they should uh, be aware that there are certain important primary sources to understand the past. And our past was much better 
than what the present decade or so have been in India. Uh, yes, we were fighting sometimes, but we were generally cooperating. As you today pointed out, that the Gujarati language itself, uh, you know, uh, benefited. Uh, to, today, when we talk about Gujarat, at least I carry a different impression in my mind. Whenever Guj the name of Gujarat is taken, there is one horror image which suddenly comes before my mind. But uh, thank you, uh, Samira. Uh, uh, works like yours uh, would correct this situation that Gujarat was not always like this. It was a better place to live. It was a place which was pros prosperous. It is not only uh, the in the present five, six years that it has become prosperous, but it was one of the centers of the trade and it was one of the entrepots through which, which India as a subcontinent benefited. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank and you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.